Uh, good morning. I realized after I uploaded the video that there were quite a few other things that I wanted to talk about on the topic of sex and sexuality. And again, I just want to lift up uh, the conversations that we had and the talk that Jack Cornfield gave, that he opened it up and invited uh, just an honest and genuine exploration of where we are in ourselves and looking at how all of this was related to in our families of origin and to using that as a stepping stone for our inquiry uh, about the lenses that we have and the way that we relate to it as a starting point for how we can be with ourselves and with these experiences as they arise and particularly as teachers when we have feelings about somebody or somebody comes to us expressing feelings towards us. So um, a couple of thoughts. First of all, this is a, a not an easy topic to talk about for many people, and yet the fact that it's not easy doesn't mean that it makes it less important. I think it's opposite. The more difficult something is to discuss and talk about, often it's more important to be able to understand and to deal with. Um, I want to mention a couple of things. Um, first of all, the Theravadan tradition is the first tradition that I have had contact with, and it's the tradition that I spent a predominant period of time of my life as a monastic. And the overarching emphasis within the Theravadan tradition is that even though there isn't a judgment around sex as bad, there's a very clear opinion that uh, sensual indulgence is a, an obstacle towards awakening. And I have a story to tell you, um, which is that a friend of mine was going to a Spirit Rock singles only event and she was talking about it afterwards that, you know, it was very interesting because it is, was as if everyone left their sexuality in their shoes at the door when they, before they went in the hallway. So that a singles event in a Theravadan tradition is often uh, something where it's, there isn't really clarity or even permission how to fully inhabit one's sexuality because the implicit bias that comes through the teachings is that somehow our sexuality is an impediment towards our awakening. And within the Buddhist monastic tradition, it was very explicit. We were celibate, and if we were to transgress those precepts, it was shameful, and if we were to actually have sex with somebody, that was a disrobing offense. And so it wasn't implicit, it was explicit. And so the message is, is that if we're involved in sexuality as a lay person, that somehow we're not on the path as fully as if we were celibate. So that's a view, and there's merits to the view. It's a long-standing view. It's got a lot of energy behind it, but it's not the only view. And so within the Tibetan tradition, there's a tantric path. And while the tantric path is also not an easy path, and there's all kinds of dangers and pitfalls in that path, there's a path that describes how bringing forward a conscious exploration of sexuality and using that to understand the nature of desire, the nature of how we construct a sense of self and a sense of other, and to use that to, as a portal to open up to the nature of the mind that is beyond birth and death is another path. And so one of the things that's an available to us in our modern world, particularly when we have a willingness to look and to discern, is to see, well, what is our view? What is our experience? What is our view? And what is the view of the tradition that we are most strongly aligned with? And how does that shape the way we look at our experience? So I also want to talk about um, a friend of mine, a very dear, very, very beloved friend of mine, somebody who I respect enormously. He spent some years in the SNM community. SNM, for those of you who don't know what that means, means sadomasochism. 
And to my utter surprise, some of the things that he told me about that community completely um, blew my expectations and understanding. So I had just written it off as like, that's not something that I'm interested in. There's no value in that. And I'm just not going to go there. So I had very, very little understanding about the community and their code of ethics and how they operated and what actually happened in it. But my friend described this community as the most respectful community that he had ever engaged with because they understood limits and boundaries and they respected them with extraordinary care. The other thing he said, which completely blew my mind, is that when you enact fantasies, it has two possibilities. One is that the experience blows up the identification with the components of the fantasy, and the other is that it collapses it. So what my friend was describing was that these uh, that he was experiencing that this community was a powerful way to enact aspects of one's desire with the possibility that there could be a radical shift in the relationship with the desire. Now, whether you agree or disagree, whether you ascribe to these kinds of practices or you don't, whether you have strong feelings of aversion towards it. What was fascinating for me was because I was willing and trusted my friend and enough to listen to what he had to say, there was the possibility of, of looking at something that before would have been untenable for me. I wouldn't have had enough interest to get close enough to even hear. So within the experience of human sexuality, it is enormously varied. And I think the ethical precepts give us guidelines on how to be careful around not causing harm. And the ethical guidelines are very strongly written in terms of the preference for monogamy and people who are in the polyamorous community have feelings about why that is so and the fact that it actually isn't necessarily conducive. So we have a whole huge human experience and what do we do with it? So I think the first thing that we need to do with it is open up and know the truth of our own experience, be comfortable and confident to allow it into our own awareness, and to work with ethical guidelines that are the most congruent with our values, and to check to see if our behavior is transgressing our guidelines and to work with that. But before we're acting out, what we need to do is feel in into the whole spectrum of how this territory arises in us and to uh, be comfortable to explore it inwardly and ideally to have a circle of people around which we can talk about what's going on for us and how we're dealing with it. So as a monastic coming into the lay life, when I started dating, there were some questions that I had. And one of the questions that I had is that there are people, like when I go dancing, some of the people that I go dancing with are interested in the meditations that I do. And because the dance that I do and that I love is a contact dance, then I had natural questions about whether it was going to be appropriate or what kind of considerations I needed to have around people who were, I was dancing with in contact and then who were interested in coming into my classes. So in an effort to be careful. I was talking about it with other friends and colleagues and checking out to see what, they, what their thoughts were, what their concerns were, what their considerations were. 
And the feedback that I got was that it's really important when you are um, in territory that has some edges that you're not confident around is to speak about it with other teachers and to speak about it with peers and to be discerning because it's easy to pick friends that you know we will trust you, but it's not always easy to pick friends who will also be offering uh, differentiating feedback and asking really challenging questions. So the question around sexual intimacy with students is not just a clear cut uh, yes or no, but it's around not causing harm. And one of the ways that harm can be caused is because there's a difference in power in a relationship. And it has happened to me um, it, within my own experience that a nun friend of mine came to me and she was seeking advice because she was planning on disrobing and she wanted to be with a person that she'd fallen in love with. They'd fallen in love with each other. And she met this person because they started coming to her meditation group. And so I was talking about the ethical guidelines and the precepts and the way that it is shaped within different communities and how there's a, uh, within the Spirit Rock ethical guidelines, there's a requirement to stop having contact for a couple of months so that there's a separation from the teacher role to the relationship. And her response to me was is that, you know, that would be op applicable for somebody who uses power, but I don't use power, so it doesn't apply. And so here is a very good example of somebody who is not used to seeing herself in a role of power, who then does not feel that there is any power differential when she's in the teacher's role. And I spoke about this with other teachers and they said, this is one of the things that's very common, particularly for women or particularly for people who are commonly not in positions of power, that they do not see the power of being in the role of a teacher. So the idea is to refrain from causing harm and understanding what that means actually is very nuanced and requires a fair amount of uh, introspection as well as willingness to see what is invisible and to see the things that are not uh, clear in your own consciousness and oftentimes that kind of 360 degree view requires input from not only your own introspection but from people around you. So my invitation when you're dealing with sexuality is, as I started with the other topic, is to bring forward the question about the difference between shame and guilt and wise reflection, and to be honest and check in and see what's actually happening and to respond in a way that really meets reality where it's at without in any way covering it over or diminishing or, um, making light of the truth of your own experience <clears throat> or dismissing the truth of what's happening in the field around you, either with the community or with the individuals for whom this is arising. So it's rich, juicy stuff, folks. Fasten your seatbelts. But the only way through is in, you know, exploring it, looking at it, dealing with it, making it conscious and finding ways to speak about it even when it's not comfortable. That's it for now. Bye.